recording and I'll set up the YouTube channel and in two more minutes we start uh, the lecture. This part is not moderated. If anyone wants to say hi or anything, you just unmute yourself and take the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. It's been a long time. Good, good evening. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Hey, Mercher. Good to see you, brother. Hi, Shri. Likewise. I'm... Um, I've turned my camera off because I saw David in this really fancy shirt and I'm, I'm in this really, you know, tatty t-shirt. So I thought I'll put on my profile picture where I'm also in a smart suit just to match David's look. <laughs> I think the fashion police have the day off. <laughs> hey, brother, Bro brother, uh, brother Abi, good to see you. You too, Paul. Good to see you. Hey, brother. Yeah, I haven't seen you in a while, and I know it's not because you've been absent. It's because I haven't been around for a while either. <laughs> well, I've been, thankfully, I've been uh, picking up at uh, at work, so things things are starting to return to whatever the new normal is. But uh, things are starting to uh, pick up business wise, so that's always a good thing. Well, that's good news. Yeah. Okay, I just shared the link uh, to uh, YouTube Live. If anyone wants to share it on their social media, it's already there. So people can join us there and we'll take questions uh, from YouTube as well. Uh, five, five viewers are already there. Okay, now with your kind permission, I will now mute everyone and uh, Brother Rick, unmute yourself again, please. And uh, I'll do a very brief introduction, as we always do. And then we give uh, floor to the questions. And uh, I will remind everyone that today we won't have a usual lecture and Q&A session, but we will start with the Q&A session. So um, uh, as uh, we already asked you, if uh, you already have your questions ready, please uh, uh, please uh, can you raise your hand. You can find that button on the right side of Zoom uh, window and uh, I'll follow the order as it is. So thank you for that. So uh, welcome everyone. This is Aperia Aude 95. And today we have uh, honor and privilege to uh, host uh, brother, uh, Dr. Richard Berman, who is the author of the Foundations of Mo Modern Freemasonry, first published in 2011. Uh, and now with its uh, second edition, uh, Schism in 2013, uh, a study of the origins of ancient, ancient uh, Freemasonry and its conflict with the first Grand Lodge of England, the Moderns, and Loyalists and uh, Malcontents uh, in 2015. He already has a book, uh, Schism, which is available on Amazon and Lewis Masonics, and uh, I will drop the links if you need to in the chat room. So um, Eric holds a, a master's uh, degree in economics from University of Cambridge and a doctorate in history from the University of Exeter. Uh, he continued his research at the University of Oxford's Modern European History Research Center as a senior visiting researcher and as a visiting research uh, fellow at Oxford Brookes uh, University. His main areas uh, of study are 18th century British, Irish, and North American history. He is uh, the Princetonian lecturer for 2016, and his wonderful lectures are available online uh, if anyone wants to Google it, and you'll enjoy plenty. And he's also past worshipful master of Premier Lodge of Master by Masonic Research, uh, Quattro Coronati 2076, uh, located in London, um, in UK. So uh, once again, uh, thank you so much, um, Brother Rick, taking your uh, time on your uh, really uh, busy schedule. And uh, I hope we'll have an uh, interesting discussion today. Um, and the questions are already uh, there. I would uh, just share, uh, I will use the opportunity to just thank you so much once again uh for uh, your support that uh that was my first contact with quattro Cornati a year ago 
it was in July, August 2019 when I uh, first uh, joined uh, uh, joined the, the lodge uh, for for its meeting. And uh, brother, it was uh, kind enough to help me with my uh, with my bijou and stuff. So uh, thanks for that again. Uh, before we start the questions, I will just uh, ask one or two questions just to kind of uh, get the basic uh, basics of uh, Freemasonry as you see it, and then we move on with the questions. So, first question, just uh, just to start off the discussion. What is Freemasonry for uh, Dr. Rick or Brother Rick? What is the definition of Freemasonry for you? I, I'm not sure I have a definition of Freemasonry. You know, there are so many different types of Freemasons and so many different types of Freemasonry. I wrote um, in my very first book that there are almost as many reasons that people become Freemasons as there are Freemasons. You know, everyone sees something different and something personal in Freemasonry. And I know for many people, it's a very spiritual activity. For others, it isn't. And I think one needs to accept that there's a really large spectrum that encompasses Freemasonry. So what interests me about Freemasonry is not just the fraternalism, the meeting with one's friends and brothers in the lodge and outside of the lodge. It's also understanding and uh, beginning to really appreciate the origins of Freemasonry. Now, a lot of people spend a lot of time um, on this, and, and um, I find that relatively few, relatively few look at the facts. A lot of people look inside themselves to discover what Freemasonry is. They discover that they have an affinity for certain aspects of it, and they start to research that in a spiritual way. And I'm not going to say that that's wrong. It's not wrong. There's no right or wrong in this. But that's not what I do. What I do is to look at the people to look at the context, the social context, the political context, the economic context. And I draw from those different aspects, motivation and desires. And I interpret Freemasonry through the past, looking at evidence. And, and I find that, that is for me, at any rate, that is a very useful, very worthwhile exercise. And it improves my understanding of the craft. Now, I won't go on too long because there are other questions, but I do want to talk about why I did this in the first place. Um, I was sitting in the lodge and as a relatively, relatively young Mason and, and the words were coming out in the ritual. And I wanted to know where they came from and why we were saying them and no one knew. No one knew, how ridiculous is that? No one knew why we were saying what we were saying. So I thought I'd find out. And that, that really was the origin. That led me to do a doctorate in history focusing on 18th century Freemasonry because the stuff that I read on the subject I thought was awful. I thought I could do better and hopefully I have done. So that, that was the motivation, a desire really to find out what was going on, why it was going on to interpret it. And now when I'm acting as secretary, for example, and in emulation working in England, you uh, ask the incoming worshipful master of the lodge to pledge a number of oaths where he gives his assent to various charges. These charges have remained largely unchanged since the early 18th century when the incoming master is asked to assent to those charges as secretary, I explain what they mean and I explain their context. Now that's not in the ritual, but in English working, the Grand Lodge or, Ye, or Ye, the Grand Lodge of England, Yuji Lee, only has authority over the opening and the closing. What goes on in, in the middle is actually up to the lodge. So I think it's useful to explain why we do what we do so that people come in, they understand it. 
And by understanding it, it gives it considerably greater meaning. Thank you. And um, let's secure the second institution. I kind of understand because um, the viewers may not uh, be quite familiar um, with Quattro Coronati. And as you once said uh, in April, when we communicated regarding this first in lectures, you said that sometimes uh, at the end of the day, things come to a few people to carry all the burden of uh, supporting uh, many activities in organization. I know how much uh, you with your uh, team have been doing uh, during uh, the Corona period as well. So, and you uh, already been through the um, Worshipful Masters chair. What is Quattro Coronati? So people know better. And okay. let's raise awareness about the uh, Let's research. raise awareness, David. Thank you very much for this advertising opportunity. Um, the problem with Quattro Coronati is that most people can't spell it. So when they go on to the web and they look it up, they they can't find it. But if you're if you're very careful, you will come across it. Quattrocoronati.com. Quattrocoronati.com or the QC Correspondent Circle. Quattro Coronati was the very first Masonic research launch that was set up in England in 1884. Now, it was set up in 84, but it wasn't actually consecrated until 1886 because the Worshipful Master designate was asked by the government to go to Southern Africa and sort out some problems. So the lodge waited until he came back in 1886 and the lodge was then consecrated. And it was consecrated by a small group of eight or nine English Masons who wanted to develop an evidence-based approach to Freemasonry. So rather than what had gone on in the past, which was relatively speculative, which, which consisted of people saying, I believe this, or I think that, this was designed to produce papers, articles, books that were based on evidence, to discuss the evidence, to present the evidence, to argue the particular uh, papers. And, and what Quattoro Coronati did then, and indeed what it does now, is to invite people to present their ideas, their papers in lodge, where members of the lodge and attendees can stand up, can criticize, can debate whatever is presented. And those papers are also published every year in another book that has a very difficult name, um, but, which is known colloquially as AQC, but Ars Quatoro Coronatorum, AQC. And AQC has been published for 132 years right the way through from the beginning of the lodge in uh, 1886 i think the following year the first book was published and it's been published every november or december ever since the next version of aqc aqc 133 will be published in a few weeks time and it's a fantastic collection of papers um it's if you go back through the archives, you've got all the Masonic greats, you know, Robert Freak Gould, et cetera, et cetera. It's really, you know, all the people who you turn to when you want to see, well, what did people know about that? What did they think of this? And um, what we've been doing over the last four to five years is going back through the archives, beginning to digitize those books. And in the next few years, we're going to make available higher quality versions of the older copies of AQC so that people can either buy them and have hard copies or can download them in a high quality format online. But what Quattura Coronati does, it is still a, a research lodge. It's a relatively small lodge, uh, under 40 members, but we have a correspondence circle. And it's a funny, it's a funny expression that, but it, but it dates back again to Victorian times where the Lodge took the view that it was pointless just debating amongst itself. What we wanted to do, what we still want to, to do, is to get the information out there. So a couple of years after the Lodge was formed, we set up a correspondence circle. People could join as corresponding 
members. And that meant they would get copies of the papers, they could um, uh, send in their queries, their questions, they could get answers, they could submit papers and so on and so forth. And what we've done over the last 130 years is to convert that process from um, a two-dimensional written format into a, 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 a digital format. So we communicate over the web now, uh, not just through our own internet site, kotorokoronati.com, but we email our members on a regular basis. We uh, now obviously have lectures which are made which are made available online. So it is known as the premier Masonic Research Lodge in the world. It's certainly the oldest. I think it still produces, if not the highest quality research, certainly among the highest quality research. Uh, every member uh, is invited to participate with questions, to submit papers and so on and so forth. And every member will receive an outstandingly good book every year. Um, I mean, I don't want to spend too much time talking about it. Everything is available online. Maybe, David, you could share the link so that people could just click on and, and you know, find out for themselves. But, but, we, but we welcome members from, a, from around the world. You do not need to be a Mason. You do not need to be a man. You can be whoever you want, uh, as long as you have an interest in Masonic research and history. Thank you so much. Uh, that was actually um, my my first uh, meeting with the research part of the formation when I was as a young member trying to learn more what the craft is all about. And I got uh, kind of quite uh, easily got to the website and that's and then I started that it's document based history and not the not only the myths that I was getting from internet or from other brothers or from other sources. But uh, if, when I went through several uh, articles that was being published there, it was so excellent. It was, uh, it was just so academic in, 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 its, uh, in its content. It wasn't just uh, a kind of propaganda stuff <laughs> or putting up this myth uh, and that you have to believe or something. No, there was very academic uh, research uh, that was available. So as a, uh, as a secretary in Lithuania, I will use also the opportunity to invite everyone to, I will share the links uh, in the description of YouTube as well. And uh, you will find a lot of good material to um, heighten your knowledge, widen your understanding of Freemasonry. And um, welcome to Quattro Coronati as, um, as Rick said, there is no limitation of who can be the attendee or who can be the uh, part of member of the correspondence circle. So um, welcome everyone. Now I will, um, yeah, please, you want to add well, something? Just to say one other thing, obviously we can't do th this at the moment, but we have a policy of holding conferences every couple of years um, on specific subjects. Um, we had planned to hold one in, Boston last month, Freemasonry on the frontier, exploring how American Freemasonry developed, looking at the individuals concerned, looking at the influence of the English, the Scottish, the Irish, uh, and so on. And um, before that, we had a conference in Cambridge, England, uh, to mark the, uh, the creation of the first Grand Lodge in 1717, which gave re rise to the debate was it 1717 was it 1721 we don't we don't as you say we don't put out propaganda what we look to do is to explore the subject and it's ideal if we have more than one view because it's 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 by debating and by arguing and by looking at the evidence that people come to a better understanding and 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 that is what we try and promote through the work that we produce uh, in AQC, through the conferences that we had, through the seminars, and members of the Lodge, you know, are actively out there, excluding now, of course, COVID, but they're actively out there, you know, available for lectures. I've, I've personally traveled somewhere in the region of 300, 350,000 miles over the last 10 years, um, you know, talking to people, North America, South America, Asia, Europe, etc. It's It's hugely enjoyable. 
And the reason I wanted to do a Q&A rather than a talk is the best part of any lecture for me, and I'm, you know, I mean, I like to enjoy these things, is the Q&A. Because it's a Q&A that, that, you know, allows people to ask questions that they might have been embarrassed to ask or something that's been niggling them. You know, it's not it's not to tell people this is what I think. It's to explore ideas. And that's that's why Q&A is just so important. I fully agree with you. And I guess uh, audience here also would agree with me saying that um, uh, the, uh, the part of the success of Saperia, the activities that we do here is exactly the Q&A session, which sometimes becomes more interesting than the lecture itself because we go into so many unexplored or explored and re-exploring, re rediscovering some issues uh, with, with lecture. So thank you for that. And um, I will just remind everyone that um, uh, as we don't have lecture today, we will have questions from on, on everything, not only limited to uh, to the foundations or Freemasonry in England or America. So uh, we will have a variety of uh, uh, perspectives to, to explore. Uh, so Brother Sri, floor is yours. Thank you, Brother David. Uh, hi, Rick, uh, good evening. Uh, just a quick uh, word to everyone. I've already posted the link to the uh, Quattro Coronati Correspondence Circle membership page. I encourage everyone to click on that and explore the website. And perhaps, David, you could also post it on the YouTube channel at pleasure. Thank you. So, Rick, you mentioned the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, conferences that uh, Lodge Quattro Coronati has uh, started organizing of late. And the first one, I think, was back in 2017. And you mentioned that as well, uh, which uh, provides a neat little segue into the question, which is a fairly simple, non-controversial one, which is... Uh, when did the first Grand, uh, Grand Lodge, uh, when was it first established? Can you, for those who don't know about the argument between 1717 and 1721, just briefly touch upon what the controversy was all about? Uh, we know that you are uh, uh, a supporter of, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, theory that the Premier Grand Lodge or organized Freemasonry began in 1717. But there's another school of thought. So would you like to walk us through those two theories and, and why you think that one is right and the other incorrect, please? Okay, I think both are correct. And let me explain why. One of the problems here is to define what a Grand Lodge is. And um, the, the other problem is to um, accept that there are... Um, competing ideas and competing evidence. So Quattoro Coronati held uh, a conference in uh, Cambridge in 2016 to mark the forthcoming tercentenary of what is accepted as the um, um, original Grand Lodge, uh, the first Grand Lodge, the Grand Lodge of England. Now, James Anderson, when he wrote his constitutions um, in 1738, the second edition, gave a little history of what happened um, back in 1717 and thereafter. This was not referred to in any detail in the 1723 constitutions, in the very first constitutions. And professors Andrew Prescott and Susan Summers, in preparing a paper for the Cambridge conference, went back to look at the Apple Tree Tavern, which was where the four founding lodges met for the first time and decided to form a Grand Lodge. And they, they, they discovered that the Apple Tree Tavern that was mentioned in Anderson's 1738 constitutions didn't exist in Covent Garden at that time. And based on that kernel of evidence and supported by other evidence, they concluded that actually there was no Grand Lodge, there, wasn't, there were no Grand Masters, until 1721, that 1721 was the start date, um, and that it and that the Grand Lodge of England only really came into being with the installation of John Montague as the first noble Grand Master of Grand Lodge. Now there are a number of problems with that argument, which I've gone through in some detail. Um, 
I won't go through all of them, but I'll go through maybe two or three. And, and, and um, if you're interested in this in more detail, you can try and get hold of the... Um, no, in fact, if you're really interested in, it, in this, get the uh, volume of AQC in which all of these um, different arguments are presented on paper. I can't remember offhand what that volume is, it might be 129. Um, but if you can get hold of that, it will outline all of this in detail. But to go back, um, there were no grandmasters. Well, we know that there were grandmasters because they are referred to in the 1723 constitutions as grandmasters. They're referred to in other contemporary documents as grandmasters. And one of the most powerful contemporary documents is a letter from the Duke of Richmond, who was the fourth grandmaster of Grand Lodge, to his friend Martin Fox, who was his deputy grandmaster, saying that he did not want to have his picture painted until the portraits of his predecessor grandmasters had been painted too, and he named them, including the original three, Anthony Sayer, George Payne, Jean Desaguliers. So there is contemporary evidence that there were grandmasters from 1717 through to 1721. And that, to my mind, is, 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 is pretty powerful evidence. Now, Prescott and Summers are absolutely right. There was no apple tree tavern in the particular location that was identified in the 1738 constitutions. But there were apple tree taverns in Covent Garden, and I've listed them all. There's a whole host of apple tree taverns. And the reason is that Covent Garden is a fruit market and a vegetable market, and in and in the center of it is a specialist apple market. And the pubs around the area use that as a reference in their own name. Now, in 1738, the Apple Tree Tavern was located where Addison specified in Covent Garden. So what he did, in my view, is to embroider his, um, his account of the formation. He probably didn't know or didn't remember where the original apple tree was. So he took the location where it was in 1738. So he made a mistake. And th there are a series of arguments that reinforce all these points. But I think the main issue is this. Prescott and Summers are correct that a lot of the regulations and formal structure only came into place in 1721. And indeed, they were refined and developed further over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But I don't think one can disagree that from 1717, there was a Grand Master, that there were grand feasts, and that these grand feasts took place in a, in a venue that was called a Grand Lodge. That Grand Lodge then developed over time. So in that sense, both arguments are correct. There was a Grand Lodge, there were Grand Masters from 1717 onwards, but Grand Lodge in 1721 had a different form and structure from that which had gone before. I think I'll have to leave it like that because it is a complex subject and, and there's a lot of detail that underlies this, but I hope that provides a useful summary. It does. Thanks, Rick. I, would it be fair to say that the creation of Grand Lodge or the Premier Grand Lodge was really just a continuum because it was the first time that it was happening. And so all the pieces did not fall into place overnight at, uh, uh, you know, uh, with the stroke of uh, uh, a magic wand, but it exactly. took place over a period of time. Exactly. And I, I, I have made exactly that point myself that these organizations do not develop, do not develop fully formed. They emerge, they evolve. And uh, to, to give another example of that, the first time that there's a formal grand secretary or secretary to Grand Lodge is in 1723. You know, you have a grand treasurer that then comes in afterwards and so on and so forth. So it's an evolving process. But I do believe that it began in in fact, in 1716, because in 1716, they agreed that this was a good idea. And in 1717, they put it into practice. And then they went around effectively looking for someone to act as a figurehead to put the organization on the map. 
and for a lot of reasons that I've explained in my books, they chose John Montague, and for a lot of reasons that I've also explained in my books, he accepted. And it was that point, from that point onwards, Freemasonry exploded into the public mind. And, and, and it was from that point that it took off. But it existed in advance of that. Great. Thank you. Okay, uh, there is a question uh, from uh, Siva Subramanian. Uh, the question goes to um, Templar's time. Did Masons slash Templars visit Americas before Columbus? In uh, Rosalind uh, uh, Chapel, there is a carving of uh, maize corn in the chapel. It raises many questions. Not only in, is it an exotic plant, but it originates from North America, a country traditionally thought to have been discovered by Columbus in 1492, almost 50 years after Rosalind Chapel was built. So what's your stand on that? So did, did Masons, did the Knights Templars visit America um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the 14th or 15th century? 15th century. Yeah, I, look, you know, I, I can't speculate. Um, what I can say is that there is no evidence, or, or at least there is no evidence that has, that has emerged to date that signifies that. Um, I can also say that the uh, Knights Templars, as they're allied to uh, Freemasonry, uh, this is, I mean, if you're, if you're really looking to um, understand how the um, Scottish Rite or the York Rite developed in America. It developed in the 18th century, not any earlier than that. It developed um, as a um, uh, partly as a money-making exercise. Um, I have written. I have written on the subject. Uh, I'm more than happy to share uh, my thoughts on it. But effectively, Scottish Rite was transmitted to America through the Caribbean, uh, originating uh, in France. Uh, it was a subset of the chivalric form of Freemasonry that was incredibly popular in the mid 18th century. Um, it did not uh, arrive any earlier than that. And it developed its uh, current form really in the uh, late 18th century, early 19th century. Um, the Knights Templars and other chivalric orders in Europe were very much religious orders. Um, they were aristocratic orders. They were chivalric orders. And because the European nobility um, remained in power for so long uh, as compared to other parts of the uh, world, I'm thinking uh, in particular Sorry, accidentally turned on the mic. Right, where did um, uh, I get cut off? Yeah, yeah, sorry. No, 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 but, but it, I mean- it, I, the, the least jumps up and down all the time, so sorry. Okay, so so I'm, look, um, I'm not sure where, where you um, stopped, stopped hearing me, but uh, look, let me just say that that, that, that that to my mind, based on the evidence that I've seen, uh, there is no evidence, there's no indication that the Templars uh, were in America prior um, to, the, um, to the type of Scottish Rite, York Rite um, organizations that you see uh, today that were introduced at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th. Thank you, answers taken. Uh, Brother Norman, floor is yours, and then we'll follow other questions in the chat. Uh, thank you very much, David. And um, uh, Brother Rick, thank you very much uh, for giving us this opportunity. Um, there was a film by Woody Allen called Everything You Wanted to Know About Sex But Were Afraid to Ask. Extremely and good film. <laughs> This, uh, this feels a little bit like the, um, the Masonic equivalent, you know, of it. And, and, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, also, thank you for the very succinct um, explanation about the 
1717 verses 1721 um, episode. That was really, really um, helpful. Now, um, I, I am a, a, a London Mason um, of many decades uh, standing, and I did join uh, the uh, correspondence circle probably round about 1978. So I've got a very, very good library from from the lodge, uh, your lodge, and thank you very much for that. Um, at present, I'm a senior visiting officer um, for uh, the Metropolitan Grand Lodge. And in the course of my work, um, uh, my very pleasant work, I have to say, um, I'm called upon to uh, present Grand Lodge certificates to brethren that have passed, uh, that have been raised, of course, and are awarded one. Um, and when I do this, I do try and um, give a little bit of a, a history about um, Grand Lodge certificates, you know, when they came into being, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in the, um, in, in the information that I found, and I don't know how reliable uh, uh, that it is, um, something described as the Maxwell Papers of 1666 were mentioned um, as being some kind of publication, a pamphlet that actually referred to the presentation of the Grand Lodge certificate. Of course, um, Grand Lodge didn't come into being until uh, 50 plus years after that. I also think that in the very early days, Grand Lodge certificates were a very patchy affair. Um, and in fact, the premier Grand Lodge, the moderns, um, only got round to uh, print, to creating a printing die for certificates um, in 1751 four years after they split from the ancients. So these are the but little pieces you. of information I have, and I'd love you to expand on it. Yeah, yeah, you have got that rather wrong. Um, okay. The first Masonic certificates were introduced by the ancients. And so the ancients Grand Lodge came into being uh, 1751, uh, rather like the premier Grand Lodge, it evolved. Uh, it was a grand committee. And then it was reconstituted as a Grand Lodge, but everyone accepts that it was formed in 1751. And it started to give out membership certificates around three years later or so. And I think there are two reasons for that. Um, the first reason is that the ancient Grand Lodge was made up uh, initially, at least predominantly, by London Irish. Irish people who had left Ireland because Ireland was not in a good place at that time. The economy was appalling. They suffered from a dreadful famines and they were coming to the closest place that was an island, which was England. And they gravitated towards London. Freemasonry in Ireland was a more accessible, uh, a socially broader activity. And, and you had a membership of ancient lodges in London that were basically not, not just the relatively well off, but, but, but really a much broader social group. Um, now, many of these um, Irish in particular use London as a stopping point before going off elsewhere, either into the provinces or to America in particular. And in order to identify themselves as Masons and be able to join lodges in America or in um, provincial towns in England where they could join a network, a support network, something that could offer them employment opportunities, mutual support, etc. They needed to prove that they were Masons. And rather than do this through signs and tokens and words, they had a piece of paper. And this piece of paper was given to traveling masons who were up to date with their lodge dues and up to date with their charitable contributions which in ancient lodges were obligatory not uh, as in the premier lodge optional so that is where masonic certificates started in the late 1740s the mid to late 1750s and they began to take off they began uh, to 
um, uh, form really almost as a passport. Uh, I mean, you could say it was a proto-passport. The reason that it wasn't used in the Premier Grand Lodge, because the Premier Grand Lodge was, was really for the elevated elements of society, and they really didn't have a need. So it was only later, in the late 18th century, and more particularly in the 19th, that the idea of a Grand Lodge certificate took off. Most especially, obviously, when there was a merger between the ancients and the moderns, uh, in 1813. So that is the origin of the concept of a certificate. Um, as to the Maxwell papers that, you're, that you mentioned, I'm not familiar with them, but you made the point, which is quite correct, that there wasn't a Grand Lodge. So I'm not entirely sure uh, what, what, what they comprised, indeed, if they existed at all, but to the extent that they did exist, um, I can only think, particularly in 1666, after the build, I mean, after the Great Fire of London, that it might have been in some way a document that proved that they were proper masons, because London, of course, was rebuilt at vast expense and with considerable labor after 1666. So it may be linked to that, but it's not a Grand Lodge certificate in the form that we uh, would know now, or in the form that was known in the mid 18th century. Thank you very much. That's, um, that, that, that's an excellent explanation. And that will help me present future grand uh, lodge certificates in, in, in a better way than hitherto. Can I ask just a couple of personal questions? Um, very short. Um, were you a historian before you were a Freemason or a Freemason before you were a historian? I was a Freemason before I was a historian, or, or, or at least before I was an academic his, historian. Okay, so um, so Freemasonry sort of fired your interest, which is terrific as you, as you introduced well, it. Well, it fired my interest in a specific area, but I have to say that um, I was torn at 18 whether to read economics or to read history. Um, I chose economics, which, which, which I found extremely enjoyable. Uh, but when I retired, um, I decided that I would go back to my roots, as it were, and, 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 and um, you know, study history. So, uh, but, but, but it was Freemasonry that provided the topic, if you will, for my doctoral thesis. Thank you. The second personal um, short question that I have is that um, when we present Grand Lodge certificates, um, which are really uh, quite beautiful in their in their way, um, we encourage the recipient not to um, not to frame them and to keep them private. Um, I'm noticing your framed uh, uh, Grand Rank apron, which seems to be a past grand standard bearer and just wonder if that's got any special significance. Uh, not particularly. Um, I have a whole host of Masonic regalia. I have tracing boards and so on and so forth, but that's, uh, you're quite right, you can see that over my shoulder. Um, on the framing side, well, um, what Grand Lodge says is don't frame them because you might need them. But actually, many, many years ago, I was visiting um, a banker. He was, uh, he was an HSBC banker, British Bank of the Middle East, as it then was in Oman. And I was ushered into his office and on his wall were all his certificates, all framed and including, including his Masonic certificate. And as you say, it does look quite nice. And I think it does look good framed. And, and, I, and, and my own personal view is that one should order a copy and put the, and put the original in a frame and hang it in your loo. Thank you. Thank you for the advice. And um, thank you again for um, uh, what is going to be a very, very nice evening's entertainment. Thank you, Rick. Pleasure. Thanks so much, Norman. Um, I'll ask a question. Uh... Next question comes from uh, Brother Hassel. Uh, is about the four lodges, the founding ones. Who granted the warrants to those four lodges to operate? These four lodges must have operated before December 17, 17. 
no one granted them. Most lodges were set up on their own recognizance, and that remained the, the case right the way through uh, the 18th, well, the 18th and the 19th centuries. Um, if you look at America, for example, you see a number of lodges that are warranted by the Grand Lodge of England, either moderns or ancients, uh, by Ireland, by Scotland, by Mother Kilwinning Lodge, etc. But you see even more that have formed themselves. They don't have a warrant from anyone else. They have, there's a group of Masons and they get together as a collective and they form a lodge. So now, well, where does all this come from? Um, originally, and I'll just talk about England. Um, I could talk about Scotland too, but let me talk about England. Originally, if you wanted to form a guild or a lodge of Masons, or indeed of any other trade, you went to the local municipality, the local town, and you obtained a charter. And you would pay for that charter and the charter would set out what you were entitled to do and uh, what fees you would need to pay on an annual basis and what fines you would need to share with the uh, local town and so on and so forth. So there was a form of chartering. But when you look at lodges that are non-operative, that are not chartered by the town, that are not required to share their fees or their fines, they are formed themselves by their members. Now, what made them, what made them go to the Grand Lodge and say, I would like a charter? Well, this is very interesting. This is where the idea of a noble Grand Master comes in. This is actually why the Duke of Montague and his successors as Grand Masters of Grand Lodge, both in England and in Scotland and indeed in Ireland, are so important. They imbue Freemasonry with this, with this, uh, with this aura. You know, by joining Freemasonry, you can be as a brother to a member of the aristocracy or to a member of the royal family. So it attracts the aspirational people who want to improve their position in life socially, financially, philosophically, etc., etc. People who are keen on personal development, and that drives lodges to go to the Grand Lodge and say, I would like a charter, please. Now, this isn't only one way. Some of the lodges uh, from time to time find, find that they don't get on that well with Grand Lodge, and they secede. And one of the classic examples of this occurs in the 1730s, so only 20 years after the formation of the first Grand Lodge of England, when one of the founding lodges Lodge number four, the lodge that was formed at the Runner and Grapes and the Horn Tavern Lodge. So lodge number four resigns from the Grand Lodge of England and stays as an independent lodge for a number of years until the 1740s, late 1740s, when it comes back into the fold. It's persuaded to come back into the fold by its then master, who is George Payne, who is the second Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of England. So there is a to and fro. There is a to and fro. And um, but but uh, the four founding lodges were very unlikely to have obtained charters from anyone. They joined. They uh, are considered to be time immemorial lodges, and they don't have a charter today. It's only lodges that come in after 1717 that actually have a charter. And some of the lodges that predated 1717, but joined Grand Lodge after 1717 and received a charter from Grand Lodge, rank more junior than lodges that actually were formed after them because they have a charter. And you see exactly the same thing in Scotland, actually. So I'm not sure if that answers the question directly, but I hope it was of interest. It was a very interesting answer. Uh, just uh, to follow up uh, this topic before we move to another one. Uh, we remember Bob Cooper um, have been asked the same question regarding who the, the first uh, lodges, who they were chartered or 
who consecrated them. And he went back and, and he told us uh, that it was church, actually, who gave uh, the first um, consecration or uh, first uh, chartering of the, the very ancient lodges because Grand Lodge came up as a federation at, uh, not the visa versa in Scotland. So um, it's interesting. I, and we know that in England there are uh, lodges which uh, operated uh, before uh, Grand Lodge has been uh, kind of created, established, and they don't even have numbers right now. They are kind of come from time immemorial and they're still operative, right? Those yes, lodges there are exist. Some. I think what you need to um, appreciate is that the original guilds were religious organization that that that, that um that the trades whether they be stonemasons or carpenters etc are doing god's work you know and 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 what they do right the way through to the middle of the 14th century is considered predominantly a religious activity it's only after the black death when there's pressure upward pressure on wage rates that you see the, lo the lodges transformed from the original guilds into a more operative um, proto-trades union, if you will. So the structure of the lodge begins to change in the second half of the 14th century, and this becomes more embedded in the 15th and the 16th. And then by the 18th century and the 19th, of course, the operative side has gone almost completely. And we're now looking at organizations which are uh, what we call speculative, but, but, but actually aren't always speculative. They are fraternal organizations rather than operative organizations. So there is this evolution. And in Scotland, and I don't want to um, you know, argue against what Bob says, particularly since he's not here and I haven't heard what he said for myself. But in Scotland, um, you have obviously you've got the Shaw reorganization um, and, and Scottish lodges remain operative for much longer than they do in England. Um, it's quite interesting. Um, but when you look at the creation of the Grand Lodge of Scotland, which was in 1735, you know, you say, well, why? Why was it so much longer after the Grand Lodge of England or the Grand Lodge of Ireland? And I think the answer is twofold. One is that the lodges in Scotland were more independent and much more operative in their nature. And gentlemanly Freemasonry only really begun, uh, only really begins in Scotland in what you would see as its, you know, its current form in the 18th century. And it's very interesting that the founding lodges of the Grand Lodge of Scotland, the four founding lodges there, were gentlemen's lodges from Edinburgh predominantly. And they were looking to emulate the success of the Grand Lodge of England. And even though there was no direct connection between the Grand Lodges of England and Scotland, when you look at the people involved themselves, the aristocrats in Scotland, about six or seven of them were also, you know, became Grand Masters of the Grand Lodge of England. These were individuals, wealthy individuals, who had uh, homes in both Scotland and in England who were uh, in many cases representative peers, so sitting in the House of uh, Parliament in London. They had friends in London, they socialized in London and Freemasonry was part of that sociability. So the Grand Lodge of Scotland was formed really not as a, 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 as, as a groundswell, a, a demand rising up from the Scottish lodges writ large. It, it, was, it was almost a small group of lodges who put themselves in a position that they wanted to do what London was doing and have their own Grand Lodge. And when they sent out letters to the hundred or so Scottish lodges saying, would you like to be part of this new Scottish Grand Lodge? Two thirds of them said no. <laughs> you know, they, they, didn't, well, they didn't want to. They had 33 representatives at the first meeting. But when they started numbering to give seniority and to show, you know, well, you know, I was the oldest, you know, I'm number one, I'm number two. That was when you had a rush of lodges in Scotland saying, yes, I want to be part of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. It's a way for me to affirm my, uh, my longevity, the, you know, my seniority, and so, on and so forth. 
Thank you. Uh, just uh, on the same topic, and I'll give the floor Shri again. Um, you've been uh, kind of interchanging the two words, uh, the guild and the lodge. So uh, do you differentiate it in the Freemasonry or? No, how, how... I mean, the, the guild um, is, uh, is the original term. Um, and the guild was the organization that would be chartered. Um, a lodge would be the organization that is um, specific to a particular building. But over time, the guilds begin to die out. And the lodge, as we know it today, begins to move forward or into the forefront. So the guilds still exist in England. We have the great guilds, the great city guilds of London, but they are not really involved with any uh, operative um, trade anymore. Um, or if they are, it's largely tangential. So the idea of the lodge really becomes much more dominant from the 17th century and certainly into the 18th. And although you can use the terms interchangeably, I think for probably the 16th century and the 15th up to a, a point, the guild to lodge does mark this transition from operative through to uh, what we now call speculative. But there is a crossover. Sure. Thank you. Uh, just uh, the understand that we were getting, at least myself, uh, from these lectures, uh, which we had uh, very interesting speakers, it was that a guild was more like public body, incorporated, as you would say, uh, which uh, included not only pre I mean, the Masons, uh, as a trade man, uh, but uh, also a uh, few other uh, trades. And the lodge was uh, exactly the place where you would transfer mason to mason the secrets of the craft, of the masonry. So it was unofficial kind of secretive part uh, which was there. So that's why I asked if that was... Uh, I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I would agree with that, actually. Okay. I mean, I'm... I'm it's an interesting subject, and again, it very much depends on the definitions that you use. Um, but guilds would not generally uh, absorb more than one trade. There are exceptions to this, and I'll give you an example. In Chester, at the, uh, which is a, uh, a city in the um, uh, northwest of England, uh, it was a very important place. Um, in Chester, there were two Masonic lodges, or let's you know, call them that. And both of them were for gentlemen. They were not operative. And when um, a small group of stonemasons arrived in the town, they petitioned the town council and said, could we uh, either join one of these uh, or form our own? And the town council, many of whom were members of these gentlemen's organizations said, no, you can't do this. Um, uh, you can join the carpenters uh, because that's an operative organization. And that's exactly what they did. And, and, I, and you know, you can read about this. You can read about this in the history of Chester and uh, so on and so forth. And it's all, it's, it's all very clearly documented. So the lodge, um, in that sense was just a club. It was a fraternal organization, had nothing to do with operative whatsoever, but a lodge of carpenters at the same time was operative. So, you know, I don't think it's one or the other. I think all of these issues are nuanced and, and you need to understand that there are significant variations rather than just saying it's either A or B. Okay, thank you for your answer. Shri, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Brother Rick, you were talking just now of uh, gentlemen lodges and, and also of uh, the aristocracy, which played such a great role both in England and Scotland in, in the early uh, years. Uh, my question is in relation to one of those, shall we say, uh, pillars of Freemasonry, which is that uh, everyone is on the level. Now, much like 
the Declaration of uh, Independence, American Declaration of Independence, which said that, you know, began with, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Even masonry suffered from a slightly Orwellian interpretation of that, in that some men were clearly more equal than others for a very long time. Do you, uh, do you in your opinion, because you have studied uh, 18th century uh, Masonic history in such detail. Do you think that's a fair criticism to be made, uh, to be leveled across the board, or was it more uh, sort of jurisdictional? Was it, for example, in, uh, say, the United States, where uh, Prince Hall Masonry developed on its own uh, because of certain biases, but perhaps not so much in Scotland, where everyone was welcome to join, irrespective of class, creed, or, or perhaps even race? What is your take on the equality or, or, or the openness of masonry to uh, people of uh, different uh, backgrounds? Um, I think your original point is a, is a valid one. It is, um, you know, one can compare it to a certain extent to Animal Farm. Um, but again, these things change, they evolve over time. So English Freemasonry, uh, certainly before 1750, was relatively elitist, not exclusively elitist, but relatively elitist. One of the reasons that the ancients were so successful was that they opened Freemasonry to a far more uh, broader social um, spectrum. So from the uh, elites right the way through the middling to the lower middling, the really, you know, really aspirational um, you know, what one might call working class or aspirational working class, of people who want to get up and, and get on. America was very similar. The first Freemasonry in America is, is also very elitist. It's, it, it is a space that's occupied by planters, by merchants, by lawyers, by uh, senior politicians and officials. And that again remains the case right the way through to the 1750s when immigration begins to take off and in particular Irish immigration, and this is Scots-Irish immigration, it's not Southern Irish, it's the Ulster Irish coming uh, predominantly from Ulster, but also from around Dublin, who uh, move into the American frontier, particularly in the central states, North Carolina, South Carolina, Western Virginia, Pennsylvania, as they move west, they, they carry their Freemasonry with them and, and it's a more accessible form of Freemasonry and it opens up the craft to a far broader group of people. And in, uh, in the 1770s with American independence and then with, um, you know, with the war and then finally independence, what Jefferson said, I think, is very important here, that America has a, has, has a new ruler. And America's new ruler is the American people. And the lodge is identified with the American people. It's with that accessibility, with that democracy, with republicanism, with the enlightenment. So um, it, it is the case today that some lodges are going to be more elitist than others. Some lodges are specific to uh, particular groups, you know, footballers, lodges, motorcyclists, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, they have generally been associations of friends and families. And that has been the case really since the earliest years. They tend to be specific to locations or specific to particular interests and so on and so forth. You invite your friends, you invite members of your family, and that's how a lodge develops. And indeed, just following that argument, that's one of the reasons why I don't think one should be too concerned if lodges die out. It's a natural process. I mean, this, this, this happens. It's uh, more of a concern if new lodges don't form. So, to come back to the start, yes, there is elitism in Freemasonry. Uh, yes, there is lip service paid to fraternalism, but in the vast majority of lodges, fraternal, fraternalism is a very real concept. It's a very genuine concept. And it's a concept that became embedded, I think, in English Freemasonry 
with the merger of the ancients and the moderns. Um, and it's certainly the case today in American Freemasonry, and I say American meaning North American as a whole and, and to a large extent in Latin America too. It is uh, open, it is uh, fraternal in the broader sense. And I think that applies pretty much everywhere I have been. There are always exceptions, but um, the rule today largely is that it is, it is a relatively egalitarian organization. Well, actually, just on that point, one of the strongest arguments in favor, if you ever get the chance to go to an American state grand lodge for their annual communication and to see how absolutely everything is voted on by the floor, every lodge attending has a vote and they use that vote and they debate actively. It is, it is a democratized process and it's wonderful to, to uh, see. But when would you say the, uh, the democratization across masonry or the fraternalism really came to fruition? Uh, would it be sort of uh, the mid 18th century or even it earlier depends on the country. It depends on the country um, and indeed on the region of the country. I mean, to, to take India as a case in point, uh, Indian masonry originally was very much for the uh, Raj. Um, it was open to um, the uh, Indian community writ large in the second half of the 18th century and was so successful that really by the, uh, sorry, did I say 18th? I meant 19th. Um, <laughs> by the end of the 19th century and into the 20th, I mean, Indian you know, Freemasonry is, 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 I mean, it's wonderful. I mean, it is open, it's wonderful. Um, in Australia and New Zealand, um, I think there it's been open to pretty much everyone since inception. Um, in Southern Africa, it still has real issues. Um, in America, you still have issues as between, as you mentioned, Prince Hall and state Freemasonry. Um, the majority of states recognize Prince Hall, a minority do not. And, and I find it shameful that they don't. Um, so, you know, it's still an evolving process. But the broad move towards democratization, I think, occurred from the 1750s onwards. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Shri. Uh, there is a, a question from Colin. Can you give us a link where your definition of the ancient charges can be found? Yes, I can actually. If you go onto um, the Quattoro Coronati website and you click on uh, research resources, um, you'll see there um, indexes to past volumes of AQC and you'll see um, copies of the old charges uh, under early Masonic manuscripts. And if you want to go through those, there's a, I mean, it's a huge collection, but if you want to go through those, you, you will find examples of the old charges. Uh, in some of my work, I've, I've actually done a compare and contrast of the old charges and the new charges uh, to explain the importance of understanding what is different between the two sets of, uh, of uh, oaths. Okay, I hope uh, Colin, you, uh, the answer has been, uh, your question has been answered. My question, Rick, um, um, I've been re-watching re uh, your uh, excellent lecture and uh, one of the questions that arise uh, from uh, your version of history, how, uh, how uh, after uh, so many deaths and uh, work uh, force um, shortages and it kind of came to the actually guild became a, a supply regulator uh, for the masons to be out there so they can regulate somehow the wages that was uh, controlled by the municipalities or whoever the authorities were. And they tried to involve the authorities in the lodges so they can be more kind of influential stuff like that. And then you also mentioned that it wasn't uh, unique uh, for Freemasons, uh, are not Freemasons, but Masons only, but other trades as well. So Absolutely. other guilds of other trades also had Absolutely. noble guys, right? 
So, Absolutely. This, so is, here, this is true for all, all, all such organizations. So here is my question. How come, uh, how come that, uh, and one more fact as well that you mentioned that uh, when the Grand Lodge of um, England has been um, created, 1717 or 1724, whatever, uh, you had four lodges. And the one of them was fully noble, like 70 members, if I'm not mistaken about the number of the no. members. And those guys kind of took control because they had some values, Hugonets and everything, everything. So they took control of masonry as such as uh, some sort of uh, uh, yeah. tool of the instrument. And they created and they kind of uh, tried to put uh, the royal uh, kind of representative of the Grand uh, Master. It took some while. But my question is, if supposedly every single, uh, not well, at least most of the trade guilds had the nobility in with them or some influential guys, how is that Freemasonry became the only so much influential throughout the history and not Carpenters Guild or I don't know other uh, so many uh, trades guild that were out there. So what was this special? I think there's a, this is a very difficult question to answer. So I can only give um, I can only give a view, um, and and the view is based on a couple of things that distinguish stone masonry from other other trades. Um, at the beginning of the 18th century, there was an upswing of interest in the uh, Temple of King Solomon. And stonemasonry was obviously associated with that, but stonemasonry was also associated with what I call the, um, the commanding heights of society. So stonemasons were associated with castles, with churches, with city walls, with the construction of St. Paul's Cathedral, with the rebuilding of London and so on and so forth. Stonemasonry was also very much associated with geometry, with architecture, areas that were really beginning to achieve some considerable popularity um, in the early 18th century. You look at the aristocracy going on the grand tours to Italy, uh, to Greece, and there they, they, they um, come across the magnificent architecture of Rome, of Athens, they bring back models, they bring back plans, they bring back books by Vitruvius and so on and so forth. And this becomes, if you will, part of the enlightenment culture. And I think that is part of the reason why among all the different guilds and trades, organizations, why the stonemasons and Freemasonry achieved prominence. And once it began to achieve prominence, it built a, a, a momentum that was almost self-sustaining. As aristocrats became associated with it, others wished to become associated with it too, again, inviting in friends and family. So I think it was, as it were, cresting a wave at that point. It could have been something else, but you know, stonemasonry was associated with a number of key thought processes uh, that were that were coming to the fore, the end of the 17th century and beginning of the 18th century, associated with the Enlightenment, associated with antiquarianism, or um, and associated with the architecture that a lot of these guys were seeing on the continent. Uh, just to follow it up, uh, and yes, I see all the hands, and uh, you'll have uh, your um, the microphone. Just uh, to follow up, do you think, or to what extent, the hermetic ideas that might have been um, uh, part of the Freemasonry, speculative uh, masonry, uh, play a role in uh, becoming them kind of more? attracting and more influential and kind of overlived the, or outlived the other guilds? I think hermeticism was involved in a number of other areas. There were 
um, Freemasons at the time who were very much interested in the, interested in, in in antiquity and in the occult. Uh, although Isaac Newton wasn't a Freemason or um, uh, or associated with Masonry, and despite being one of the, if not the leading scientist of the age, he was also interested in in the occult, um, etc. Most people were at that time. I, actually, I won't say most. Many people were at at that time. So you have examples of William Stukeley, who was a Freemason. One of the reasons he joined Freemasonry was to understand the antiquarian nature of Freemasonry and to look back to the past and so on and so forth. So once again, I don't think you can generalize. You cannot say this was for everyone. This was for a majority. This was a, a sort of driving force. But people were interested. Yes, of course they were. And this was part of their uh, motivation. But the guys behind um, the new form of Freemasonry were rationalists, were scientists, were enlightenment figures. And that uh, overtone is something that, 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 that begins to um, drive Freemasonry forward from the 1720s onwards. And certainly its association with the Enlightenment, with Enlightenment thinking, is what drives its uh, success in America, uh, in Europe. It becomes, it becomes a tag that people see and want to be associated with, but it's bound up with all sorts of other things. I mean, there's enormous uh, dispute going on between France and England over which scientific process is the best, Newtonian science or, you know, Cartesian science and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's bound up with a lot of things. I don't think that the, that hermeticism was a huge driver, but it was something that was involved. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Brother David, the floor is yours. Felty. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to add a little things? bit of... Uh, please, Rao, please uh, yeah. raise your yeah. hand or yeah. wait. Uh, please don't unmute yourself. Otherwise, we'll have a lot of... Uh, everyone will be taking the floor and it won't be a discussion. I'll give you the floor if you could raise your hand and uh, we'll follow the order for sure. Would it be okay? Okay, Brother David, floor is yours. Okay, I just wanted to add a little bit of counter evidence from my own family history in the United States. I had a, um, a grandfather, uh, an uncle, and two cousins, one still alive, that in the states of Kentucky, Florida, and eventually my cousins went out to Arizona, were operative Masons. My grandfather kind of set the pattern when he made the comment that I heard as a kid, I'm not going to join the Freemasons, they're all a bunch of bankers and coal mine owners. So he became an odd fellow instead because he said those were regular working men. And by the way, the odd fellows, I've looked at their rituals, they are also a hermetic uh, society. Uh, so uh, it's not quite as egalitarian in the United States Freemasonry as as you might think, it was maybe not until after World War II into the famous 1950s, where everyone turned anti-communist, got married and had lots of babies that, and started raising families, that, uh, that a wider range of men in the United States really looked to Freemasonry, other than the bankers, the lawyers, and the uh, coal mine owners, probably the iron mine owners also. Yeah. Well, I'll go back to what I said earlier, that, that, it's, that it's impossible to generalize on these things. There are, you know, you have to look at life as, as a whole series of different shades of gray. There are many nuances. And as I said also, that, you know, it is still the case today that there are elite lodges. Uh, there always will be. Uh, but equally, there are lodges that are open to all. So, um, you know, I've, I've been to lodges in the States, uh, which are uh, on, the, on the surface, very elite, you know, traditional observance. But actually the guys who are members of those are, are, are from all, you know, from all walks of life. Equally, we I like mean, to, to, hmm? 
we I'm like sorry? to joke in we like to joke in Florida. There is a particular lodge north of us in Georgia. Yeah. Uh, we, we Floridians consider ourselves to be much more sophisticated than people in Georgia. <laughs> and there is one rural lodge in Georgia where they meet on the level in their bib overalls yep. for lodge. Yep. And we will drop in, uh, groups will drop in on them because of that quaintness. Yeah. You know, um, as I said, there will always be lodges that are relatively elitist and that is how Freemasonry started um, but it has become more egalitarian uh, over the years uh, and today I suspect um, that you know that is its future the problem with an elite is that it's limited in number and, and I do and I do not disagree with the fact that Freemasonry today is quite egalitarian by a yeah. lot of standards uh, I would point out, though, and we need to always remember, there's a difference between being elite and being elitist. Yes, yes, that's true. That is very true. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, I will, is there are so many questions. Uh, I will try to uh, kind of uh, get uh, a question from the chat. Uh, there are some on YouTube and then also the ones who have raised their hand. So uh, the question comes from Admin Martin, uh, DC. Uh, how do you reconcile being Freemason and, and the idea that we should all believe in a supreme being, and yet it is possible many don't? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Okay. Uh, how, how do you reconcile being a Freemason and the idea that we should all believe in a, a supreme being, and yet it is possibly many don't? don't believe well um it's it's a criteria for membership uh in england and i guess in a lot of other places that you need to believe in a sovereign being um and uh if your jurisdiction doesn't require that then uh it probably replaces it with a belief in good and evil or something which is very close to uh, a supreme being. But um, I suppose that, that um, a lot of people would say that if you don't believe in a supreme being, then um, a lot of Masonic organize, organizations could not accept you as a member. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brother Jawad, floor is yours. Thank you, Brother David. I have a question. My question is, uh, what are the most salient differences between the English and American Freemasonry? Well, I think that's a very interesting question. It's not so much in the ritual, uh, because although the ritual differs um, around the edges, um, it's about 90% of the same. Um, and I don't think it's very much in the method of organization because that's pretty similar as well. Um, uh, I mean, from my experience of American lodges, um, every meeting starts with a pledge uh, out of the flag and so on. Uh, whereas in England, we sing God save the queen afterwards if we do that at all. Um, I'm not sure there's a huge distinction at its core, really. Um, for an Englishman or a Scotsman or an Irishman, you know, going to America, experiencing a lodge in America, they will feel very much at home, very familiar with what's going on, and indeed vice versa. We have Americans in my lodges. Um, and I'm American, you know, and I'm Ameri sorry, I'm a member of an American lodge. Um, and, you know, it's fine. Um, the same applies, I think, in most of the lodges that I've been to around the world. The core is the same. Um, obviously, in you know, if I go to Sweden uh, or Norway and I experience, you know, Swedish right um, above four or five, it's a very different um, organization. But but the first three four are the same at their core. And I think this is one of the wonderful things about Freemasonry. You can see variations, but the core substance pretty much is the same. 
Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother Jawad. Uh, the question comes from uh, Sivas Ubramanian. The second question. In a Masonic lecture on the history of Lodge P2 of Italy, the narrated uh, history was that the brethren were political, took excessive advantage of the political connections they established in the course of the history of the Lodge, profited uh, by accumulation of power and enormous wealth to a self-serving end. Is there a possibility that Masonry decided at that point of time to portray the history of the Lodge more narrowly than how the Lodge and its brethren served a possible larger design? Masonry conceals, not reveals, as happened during the episode in I'm plain not, public view. Really, yeah, I'm not really qualified to comment on P2. Uh, okay. It's not something that I've studied. Um, I think Mike Kearsley has a lecture that covers P2 and uh, Calvi and so on. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to pass on that question, if I may. And, sure. and can I also say, can, can we draw a halt at about quarter to seven? Because I need to be somewhere else at seven. Quarter to seven, which so means... About, uh, about 15, 16 minutes. Okay. So you can it's always more. do another Q&A. Okay, <laughs> okay. Let's, let's be very short in questions and answers then. So, um, okay, uh, Mike will be delivering his lecture uh, December 16th on P2, so you'll have uh, plenty of time to join us and ask your questions there. So, um, Brother Istvan, floor is yours. Let's make it as short as possible so we can enjoy at maximum these 15 more minutes. Yeah, I, I just wanted to touch on that fact that uh, in your uh, PhD thesis and, and the book after that, uh, and in your Prestonian lecture as well, you made very clear that you don't agree with that traditional history that op operative masons transitioned into uh, speculative mason. And if you could briefly touch on that, thank you. Well, um, as you say, that's, that's broadly speaking, the first half of my Prestonian lecture, which goes on for around half an hour, just on that section. I'm not sure I can do it briefly. Um, what I would say is that um, the, my opinion, based on the uh, evidence, the material that I've studied, um, is that there is no um, um, continuous line uh, of development. There is development, but there are some fundamental step changes that take place. And I explained in my Prestonian lecture uh, and in my various books that, um, that, that two of these elements are the Black Death, which um, alters the function of a lodge uh, to become more of a collective bargaining organization. And then uh, in, the, in the 17th century, the, um, the restructuring of the lodge into more of a fraternal uh, as opposed to operative organization. And then finally, of course, in the 18th century, um, the remolding of Freemasonry into an organization that has um, an enlightenment agenda at its core. And I discuss why that happens uh, the background is the century and a half of religious warfare in Europe, a threat posed to the new uh, king in England, George I, by uh, the followers of James Stuart, the, the son of the exiled king. Um, so there's a there's a um, um, there's a uh, there's a congregation of influences that are political, that are religious, that are, that are economic, that come into being in the 18th century, but they build on these different um, um, step changes that take place in the 14th century uh, and in the 16th and 17th. So I don't see it as some romanticized, um, steady progression but as an organization that is buffeted by the winds of change and by different individuals, and that directs it on its path. Thank you. Uh, Brother David, the floor is yours, Barrett. 
let's i mean um, i'm maybe skipping some questions or uh, comments that very uh, that are very interesting in uh, in, in public chat so just to yeah. be time yeah. efficient yeah please uh, david th thank you brother david uh, your short comment possibly on the real influence of the royal society masonry in england Sorry, was that just asking that I comment on the influence of the society? Yeah. Of the Royal Society. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> of the Royal Society. And, yeah, and I mean, the, it's and, difficult, the development, um, and the development of yeah. the Nation in England. Um, I mean, the Royal Society itself, of course, didn't have any influence. It was the fellows of the, of the society that, um, that were influential. Um, and it's difficult to know um, whether it was one way or the other. In other words, whether the fellows of the Royal Society were attracted to Freemasonry because of its Enlightenment views and its association with key figures, or whether Freemasons were uh, attracted to the Royal Society. And, and in fact, it was probably a bit of both. You see key figures in the Royal Society who have tremendous influence over Freemasonry most notably, there's a Gullier, but also, but also uh, Martin Fawkes, of course, both John Montague, the, uh, the first Grand Master, uh, Richmond, the fourth Grand Master. I mean, probably, I mean, just off the top of my head, two thirds of the first bunch of Grand Masters were fellows of the Royal Society. What the Royal Society represented was a rational approach to, uh, to understanding life a belief that you could measure, uh, that you could look at things objectively. Um, and, and Freemasonry was uh, molded in that image. Uh, the Royal Society was an organization where it was considered completely inappropriate to talk about politics and religion. Um, it was one of the few organizations other than Freemasonry where um, the membership voted uh, to, to, to elect council members, to elect vice presidents, to elect the president of the society. So yes, it, 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 it had many, many of the attributes that Freemasons were looking for and Freemasonry absorbed many of the attributes of the society. It is absolutely clear that, 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 that a lot of uh, members of the Royal Society became Freemasons and it's equally clear that a lot of Freemasons were invited to join the Royal Society. So there was a very close connection, but the influence was two ways, not just one way. Thank you. Uh, Brother Rao from India. Unmute yourself first and the uh, floor is yours. Yeah. Now you are able to hear clearly. Yeah. Yes. Very very short, good. please. Yeah, yeah, very short. Yeah. You see, I would like to have some detail of uh, what was spoken about the age of enlightenment, because the 17th century saw a major change in social structure. If the feudal system was declining, you found that public sociability was surging. And the earlier feudalism was being replaced by people becoming aware. They were coming out and speaking for the first time. This was the age of enlightenment. Mm. And it's during this time that the craftsmen, they found that the design of the castles and cathedrals was not merely a trial and error or previous experience. They needed the academic support of the experimental methods of Galileo or the mathematics of René Descartes. So these were the knowledges which are available with the people who had studied. They had that skill. They had no hand skill, but they could assist. And it's in this sense that these classes who are not strictly operating, they were not masons per se. They were accepted into the society under the same conditions of maintaining secrecy. And their assistance was sought and then subsequently, they found that while they were able to satisfy the, the operative masons, their own skills were not being fully accepted or extended. 
and this is where they started their own lodges. So the earlier ones were still called the guilds and their craft lodges. Brother Al, question yeah. please. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, are you able to hear? It, yes, uh, oh. could you, could Let you me ask comment. the question? Oh, oh. It's, not, it's not a question. They are merely saying that if this is a fact, that's right. That the, the influence of the, the okay. academics okay. came into being. Yeah. We right. have eight minutes uh, with Rick. Later no. on, we can stay and continue the discussion. No, no problem. I'll, I'll tell you. No, no, I, I got my suggestion. I'll uh, type out what I'm speaking now and send it to you, pass it on to Rick. Then he can answer me later on. Sure. I will not disturb you. Now. If sure. that is okay, I'll send it to you. I'll yeah, send yeah, it yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Thank okay. you. I'm sorry I disturbed you. No, oh, you don't disturb. Good. Just uh, good. as we have yeah. little time, I just try to That's moderate. Good. Next time, if I dress myself, I think I'll come on video also. No uh, problem. Camera, you don't disturb I don't anyone. Have, I don't have a Thank good you, camera, Brother Al. So I'll come. Yeah. Certainly, Brother most Sh certainly. Yeah. Brother Thank Sri, you. your question? Yeah. yeah uh, Brother Rick, I thought uh, I'd ask you something about what you, you know you mentioned. Uh, you were discussing the role of uh, the Royal Academy and, and uh, Masonry, and how uh, you had a common pool of, uh, of members. Uh, sort of uh, coming from that, uh, where do you see? Uh, you, you know, uh, there's this whole uh, uh, sort of uh, school of thought which believes that most of the uh, or rather so many of these independence movements, for example, uh, across the world uh, were uh, uh, fermented almost in lodges and not just in the United States, but Southeast Asia, some would argue even uh, a lot of the founding fathers in the Indian independence movement were Masons. Uh, how much of this is actually causation and how much of it is just correlation? How much of it is just a self-selecting group of individuals who are free thinkers uh, how much of it yeah, is, is money is with the other? This is a hugely difficult subject to answer in a in a short space of time because the answer is it depends. Um, in 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 countries where um, there is an autocracy, the one thing that a dictator does not like is uh, lack of control. And the one thing that uh, a lodge can provide is a space for conversation and discussion that is private. So um, did Freemasonry attract uh, people who were interested in um, exploring ideas and exploring thoughts that were not necessarily acceptable to the, um, uh, to the powers? At that time, I think the answer is yes, it happened. Uh, does that mean there was a Masonic conspiracy? No, I don't think it does. So, um, you know, I could talk about how this worked in 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 Prussia, or in uh, or in different American states, or in South America, uh, with you know the most obvious example being Bolivar. Um, uh, but, but you know, it is a very complicated subject. And I think, again, you need to look at the specifics of the countries, of the people involved. But the one takeaway, which is clear, at least to my mind, is that this is not a Masonic conspiracy. This is the, um, this is the ability of people to work within a lodge environment, which, which, which can be and often is an enlightened environment. So an organization that promotes a belief in education, an organization that promotes a belief in constitutional government, a belief in democracy, a belief in, 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 in progress based on merit. I mean, all of these things we were just set out in the charges where one gives one's assent to these as principles um, these are issues which, which a dictatorship would not wish to promote. So um, Freemasonry in uh, countries that are autocratic does and has attracted people who are not necessarily in favor of that form of government. Thank you. Uh, definitely, we don't, <laughs> we cannot... Uh... 
I ask all the questions in one session and uh, maybe one day we can host you again uh, if you will find another two hours uh, uh, for us. It will, we'll have that honor. I'll just ask last final question with your permission. Sorry, everyone, that I missed, uh, skipped uh, so many questions that you shared, but um, we should take into account the time limit that has been set. And one last question. Uh, in your lectures, you refer and you kind of develop the idea that uh, the, uh, the, the Freemasonry uh, was um, in kind of uh, looking towards more egalitarian kind of Newtonian understanding of society and kind of being more um, science-based uh, things. So why would, the, uh, why would Freemasonry um, kind of uh, impose to some extent uh, the belief in supreme being and would not allow even uh, kind of now traditionally um, the uh, kind of uh, superiority of human consciousness. I mean, freedom of human consciousness. Yeah. Uh, could that be think, also? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, what's your is, point on that? Yeah, this is again a difficult area. Um, I think you've got to look at how the lodge functioned, uh, particularly in the 18th century, where at the center of the lodge was um, education, that a lot of um, lodge meetings would involve lectures, talks, uh, self-improvement, if you will. And one of the drivers behind that, uh, as is always the case, are the people involved. So you look at the influence of Desagulier. Desagulier was the foremost scientific lecturer of his age. And many of the other uh, fellows of the Royal Society who were Freemasons would give lectures. Hobbyists, and, and a lot of people were hobbyists. They were interested in, in art and in science in different things. They would give lectures. They would talk about what they uh, were working on, what they discovered, the workings of a clock, the workings of a chemistry experiment, and so on. And this was part of the lodge meeting. You don't see this, actually. You don't see this in the ritual. Obviously, it's not part of the ritual. But you do sometimes see glimpses of it in the minutes. Not very often, because like today, most minutes are incredibly boring. You know, we turned up, this is who turned up, this is what we did, we went home. I mean, it, 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 it's dull, but some of them are actually quite interesting and they focus in on these, on these issues. So there is that. Freemasonry was bound up with education. And, and um, one of the things that Desagulier said was that education is no good without entertainment. You need to have both. And that was what he did. He, he produced entertaining lectures for the Lodge, as did others. Uh, and there are many examples of this. I think when you start to look at the small spiritual side, um, and, and Lodges did, you know, I mean, this was not excluded. Look, they, they did. Um, but uh, I think it was the case that the guiding hands behind the remolding of Freemasonry in the 18th century wanted to move away from that towards a more scientific, more Newtonian uh, based approach. And they had opposition. You know, one of the um, uh, reasons or one of the factors that the ancients put up was that the Premier Grand Lodge had uh, secularized, de-Christianized Freemasonry, had uh, opened it up to uh, many faiths, not just to the Christian faith, which was the past, but it opened it up to many faiths and so on and so forth. And they didn't like that. And there was this, you know, schism that was not just social. It was also to do with, you know, what was the rationale for being a Freemason and so on. Now, you can understand that if you're thousands of miles from home in America, for example, on the frontier, you know, your congregation with, with your brothers adopts a very spiritual uh, feel. Uh, it's an alternative, you know, to a church service and so on and so forth. There are a lot of factors involved. And I find it very, very hard to say it was either A or B. It was a whole host of things. But there are these themes. And, and the theme that the Premier Grand Lodge pushes forward is the rationalist enlightenment theme. And 
I'm putting together a website which is going to uh, provide a great deal of resource. Um, and this is going to be um, uh, put out there next year uh, in the run up to the tercentenary of the 1723 constitutions. And there'll be a lot of information on there on the impact of the enlightenment and the development of Freemasonry and its evolution. And one of the things I want to do is to um, invite people to submit papers that we can assess and, and hopefully publish on the web. So there will be not just a central view. This is not just going to be, you know, uh, this is the view and you take it. There will be discussion and debate and a confluence of ideas. So, you know, hopefully that, that will answer some of these issues and indeed raise other questions moving forward. So okay. on that note. Yes, on thank, that, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yes, on that note, let's, uh, let's uh, close the meeting. Maybe uh, you want to do some just few final words and uh, I'll... No, well, only to, to say that I very much hope that you have enjoyed this and um, I'm more than happy to do it so again. Much. I, I, I obviously I, I prefer to stick to things that I am reasonably sure about uh, as opposed to speculate on stuff that I'm less sure about. Um, but I you know I do hope that you have enjoyed it. I very much hope that you that those who are not members of the QC correspondence circle will consider be, be becoming members and 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 um, for those who are in, jurisdictions where we have amity with the Grand Lodge of England, with you dearly, you are always welcome to come along to the QC meetings in London or in the provinces or to our conferences or to our seminars when we can hold them again. Thank you so much. I'll remind that this was a period in 95 and today we had brother Dr. Richard Berman with us. Thank you so much. It was honor and uh, looking forward for next meeting. So this concludes our lecture. Today is October 14th, 2020.